First of all, I am so grateful to be part of the 2017 RX Health Summit. Um, and it has been um, an amazing experience to really encounter so many different uh, professionals in the field of plant-based nutrition and uh, even medicine and healing. And uh, so it's been, it's been really an amazing experience. So I have to say gratitude for that. And the second thing is, is wow, this journey has really been a journey all my life, really, you know, coming into plant-based and then becoming a living foodist who focuses primarily on hydration now has been a journey and a half. And I would say that it really started with me having a lifelong uh, process and having lifelong issues with constipation, with, uh, and then as I got, as I got a little older in my twenties with fibroids, with um, different dysfunctions in the body. And so now it's a journey that I took. I started being plant-based maybe about 10, 11 years ago. And now it's a journey of sensitivity. I realized that the journey is more than about, oh, this is about I'm vegan or I don't, I don't eat animals or, you know, um, I'm clean and oh, I want to be healthy, but really a journey into sensitivity via hydration and making sure that I'm electric and I stay electric. So uh, officially, I would think the timeline, the timeline started really for me uh, when I developed a cyst the size of a grapefruit on my left ovary. And this is before I turned 21 and I had to have it surgically removed and it left me questioning what I knew about health because I thought I was healthy. I read Shape Magazine, I read Muscle Magazine, I did all of the workouts, I ate two ounces of salmon with, you know, however, whatever they recommend, four ounces of salmon with brown rice and asparagus and steamed vegetables and all of that. And I was even training for a half marathon. I was actually running up to nine miles when the day after I had the long workout, I ended up having what I didn't understand at the time was a, a detox crisis. And um, my body started to kick out waste. And that's when I found out that I had the cyst on my left ovary because I woke up in an excru excruciating pain. And when I went to the ER, they finally found the cyst that was developing on my ovary. And that, was, that had to be like a Thursday or Friday and either Monday or Tuesday, I was laying on the, on the surgery table. So that was, that was pretty traumatic for me, you know, going through the process, not being able to walk immediately, um, having to take, you know, painkillers, being off my feet for a month and a half and bedridden basically, and having uh, an incision like I had had a cesarean. So, you know, all of this really hit home. And so I, um, I remember when I went in for a checkup um, with the surgeon, I, I asked the surgeon, well, why did this happen to me? I don't understand, you know, I'm healthy. I was never overweight. I was always active, you know, but um, I, uh, I remember he, he looked at me and he, showed, he said, well, you know, this is something that all black women you know, most black women experience their fibroids. It's common in the African-American community and nobody knows exactly why this is, but it's genetic. So, of course, that didn't answer anything. He said, well, we're gonna put you on this birth control and we're gonna stop you from having a period. And that's the only way that you can prevent the fibroid from coming back and ending back up on the surgeon's table. So after being on uh, birth control for a few years, uh, I gained a lot of weight. I happen to be probably about 120 right now. I was at 176 and um, and I just didn't feel good. I was, I didn't feel healthy. I felt off balance. And so I went to go see a naturopath and the first thing that she told me was that you need to give up eating animal products. And uh, she also recommended that I give up eating bread and gluten products. And that was harder than actually giving up the animal meats and cheese because I was never too big on that because I had a history of constipation. As a child, I was always constipated. Um, as a child, I was always bloated. I, and um, I, which is a whole nother story, but uh, 
the way that I consumed as a child was influenced by the fact that I grew up in foster care. So we didn't, you know, I was in a, many different group homes, McLaren Hall, and it wasn't any fresh meals. There weren't, all of the stuff that we were eating were out of boxes. So that's really in microwaves. And so this is how I grew up eating. So um, that's why I was, I was always upset. My stomach was always upset. And then if we even look at some of the history of what creates a healthy digestive system, being breastfed definitely plays a big role in the development of the digestive system. So I wasn't breastfed, I was on formula. So all of these different things really affected me and I didn't know until I developed this cyst and started going into the journey of healing myself. Um, so if that answers your question, and then I, I started to evolve from there. You know, I started to slowly cut things out of my consumption and saw the difference, saw I wasn't constipated anymore, saw that I actually didn't have gas, and then started to try different living foods and saw that I could go to the restroom a lot easier and that it was a rhythm and a pattern to it. And it was the most liberating feeling for me. So from there, I just said, I really wanna know all about living foods. I wanna know, you know, veganism is a part of living foods, so it is plant-based. Um, and living foods really brought life to me and it allowed me to really be able to even uh, address some of the emotional trauma that I had experienced growing up. So that's my journey and then I, I went into, after that, I mean I could keep going, I was just be really kind of a little bit more brief, but after that I ended up studying living foods and then I decided I wanted to make a career out of it and that's where I am today. I would say to first really listen to your body. You are your best teacher. You know what works for you, you know what doesn't work for you. Um, and beyond that, I feel that taking a common sense approach to health and wellness is really what's necessary. You know, a lot of times that's what's lacking in the classifications of being vegan or being raw vegan or being fruitarian or being whatever it is, being healthy. It's like, well, one person is, says that being, you know, a healthy vegan is this way. Another person says being a healthy vegan is this way or that way. So I would say to one, you know, listen to your body, listen to, you know, what works best for you and also begin to start to detox. That's very important. Um, I think that a lot of people, they transition into this lifestyle and they see such amazing changes in the beginning, but to continue to sustain that becomes challenging because they may not necessarily see on the surface a lot of those changes that are occurring, and so they may get discouraged. Um, and then also they, they, a lot of people feel like they can't continue the journey because they are still addicted to a lot of what they were eating before. So there's this misconception that, oh, because I changed my lifestyle today, that tomorrow uh, my food addictions and also, um, or I wouldn't say my, but the food addictions and also just the dependency that the system has on what the waste that's already in the system um, will just disappear. And that's not the case. So part of making a, a plant-based consumption and then hopefully eventually a living food consumption, because that's really what I advocate, right? Is to detox, purge, and rid the body of that toxicity that's holding it down and getting rid of certain parasites in the system that are depending on that same level of toxicity to exist so that it, those parasites can survive, right? So detoxing is important. Listen to the body and take it step by step. You know, start just by educating yourself on, on small things. Don't fight it. You know, don't say you can't do something. Don't say, oh, I could never. And you know, just, just do your research and then make, make common sense decisions based on that. It was interesting. I was actually having this conversation um, with someone here at the summit and um, she had, she had mentioned that she was deterred and um, discouraged 
by the labels of veganism and raw foodism and you know and the first thing that she said is that I'm not a vegan and I'm not really a vegetarian and um, I, I would say that um, you know when it comes to living foods we we all really are living foodists like we want to be living foodists because our bodies are living so living food is simply food that is alive. <laughs> it has its enzymes, it has its minerals, it has its water, it has all of the elements that life needs to function. So, you know, there are some scientific, uh, there are some scientific definitions that says, okay, well being a living foodist or a raw foodist is you don't heat your food over 107 or 108 degrees for more than three minutes. Or you don't, you know, there's all of these different rules of how to do it, but ultimately, you know, it's really about water for the system, nutrients for the system, what's living in those nutrients. So, you know, a, a, a dry mango versus a, a fresh mango, what would be more living? The fresh mango would be more living because it has water, it hasn't been dried out, it's in its natural state as close as possible if you're not picking it from a tree. So it really is relative, but really being a living foodist is about, um, because there are living foodists who, who consume meat as well, <laughs> right? So being a vegan living foodist is a, is a person or, who, who follows the consumption pattern of not eating any animal products and then on top of that eating foods that have not been cooked in the most basic terms but we always want to remember that hydration is the key to life so you know even with not eating animal products and eating um, foods that haven't been cooked and maybe have been dehydrated the thing to mainly remember is to consume that water intake because that is the that's that's necessary for all life to exist well the first thing if we take the common sense approach um, you know the, the body is estimated to be at least 70 percent water so if we think about that then we say on a common sense approach that we should be consuming at least 70 percent water or water foods right so uh what would that mean like how does that how does that how do we take that and and bring it into a reality beyond conception right so that means like in the am we would want to drink maybe i would say at least half a gallon of, of liquid some kind of liquid if you're drinking a half a gallon of juice <laughs> and i know that seems extreme for some people but it really it really isn't you could drink a half a gallon of water um, that's only two 32 ounce bottles of water uh, in the AM and then you have a nice melon for your breakfast and then after that you have a salad that has tomatoes and cucumbers and you know um, this will increase the level of, of water in the system and it's an interesting question because I find that the water that I need now to maintain is not the same level of water that I needed 10 years ago or that I thought I needed. You know, I look now and I'm be like, man, I feel dehydrated and I'm drinking way more water than I used to or I'm eating way more fruits than I used to. So it's all relative. Um, but if we just look at the basics, the body is 70% approximately of water. So that should be our consumption pattern, right? So if we're drinking 32 ounces, then 70% of our consumption should be water-based. The other, the other aspect of it is also, you could be drinking half a gallon of water, but then you're eating like chicken fried steak. <laughs> so then that takes a high level of water to process, right? So it's also about making sure that the other consumption is not in such a dehydrated state that it requires the body to remove water from the system or if you say you're raw vegan right and you drink maybe a half a gallon of water but then you eat two bags of kale chips 
that requires a lot of water to process, you know? So it's all relative. You can still consume animal products and be dehydrated, and you can still be a so-called living foodist and be dehydrated. So that, that, water is, uh, that, water, that water is very important. And the body uses water for everything. The body uses water to, to see. The body uses water to talk. The body uses water to walk. The body uses water just to exist. So, you know, um, you'll know when you feel hydrated. And then the other thing that's really important to remember is that it takes longer to get rehydrated than it is to, to be dehydrated, to get dehydrated. And since a lot of us are living in a state of dehydration, we're always at this compensation, trying to compensate for that dehydration. Uh, I would say keep it simple, you know, keep it simple. The thing is, is it's like so many, I remember when I first started on my journey and it was a reality, you know, it was definitely a reality that when I was in transition from eating even like uh, uh, eating cooked foods into raw vegan that there were certain textures and tastes that I was looking for with, with the food because I was in transition. Um, and now, and I had to have certain things, like I had to have cashew, I had to have ses sunflower seeds, I had to have sesame seed milk, I had to have dates, I had to have all of these different things or I thought I had to have them. And really, like I said, living food is about the hydration. So keep it simple, have some fruit. You know, the fruit is the most easiest thing to find and to consume, even if it's non-organic. Um, if you're out there and you get stuck out there, grab an apple, grab a melon, grab something that has that hydration and it won't be complicated. Now, when it comes to, let's say, you know, you're in transition and you still feel like you require, then seek out uh, companies that do meal plans. I know um, Montgomery Heart and Wellness is, has meal plans, you know, so people can order meal plans. People can order things that will help them on their way. And don't be cheap about it, you know? Like a lot of people are like, I can't afford that. I can't do this, I can't do that. Well, we're speaking that into existence, one, right? So that becomes a reality. And then the second thing is, is, is that those are just tools to help you get through that phase so that you can go to the next, next step of simplicity, you know? Being a living foodist is also about simplicity. Uh, simplicity in everything. And it becomes very easy to just get the thing from the source and it doesn't have to be you have kale chips and you have this and you have that and you need this and you know, that's all consumerism which is complicated i love that question uh, because ultimately that is what being a living foodist is about um, and that's what being a human being is about. We are here as sensitive beings. We, we come to, to experience life through our senses. Um, and the, the physical body happens to be the first body that I feel a lot of us are working from because we've been inundated with a lifetime of toxicity and damage and disease. So we have to address that first because it's very agitating, right? So we can't imagine trying to tap into ourselves and into that ultimate source if our bodies are sick, right? People have a vision of what healthy is and we have all of these gurus who are, you know, so, but ultimately we are our own guru. We have our own, own, own purposes that we come to accomplish in this life and the ideal is to be sensitive to the vibration of life around us, to the vibration of nature, to the, to the vibration of our environment, to the vibration of our communities, and ultimately to the vibration that is coming from us. And the other thing is, is, is that we carry information, trauma, uh, emotional trauma, mental trauma that may not even be ours per se you know it's just a memory that we carry within our dna and these are these are things and even in our own personal traumas we have things that we have to 
clear out and cleanse out. So the balance is, it's, it's not just about food, you know, living lifestyle, a living consumption for a living body includes the mental body, the emotional body, and all of the subtle bodies, the chakras, you know, the, um, and the physical body, of course. So the ideal is to become sensitive enough to be in alignment, to feel when there's imbalances because we all have things that we have to clear. We all have toxicities on all of those bodies that, uh, that are functioning together. It's with the physical. And I was speaking with the sister today, um, someone who was here at the summit, and she, I was, I was explaining to her that the physical represents the consumption of of everything on all of those bodies, from the mental body to the subtle body to the emotional body. We consume on those levels first because those are vibrations and then the physical body represents that consumption. So I will say, for example, I'll give an example. It's kind of a, a long-winded answer, but I, I think it's important. Um, the When I am in a more dehydrated state, than what I'm used to. I notice my thoughts are not hydrating. My thoughts can be self-defeating. Um, my thoughts can be what people may term negative and not as positive. Um, and then when I get hydrated, the same situation may occur, but my thoughts about it and my ability to function within that situation becomes different. And so it, it all ties in together, but it's important that we address it from an all-encompassing standpoint because a lot of people will make the physical changes, but because they haven't addressed the emotional, the mental, or the subtle body um, energy changes that still need to uh, uh, be, be cleansed, then sometimes it makes it easy to return back to self-defeating and parasitic lifestyles. That's interesting because my own creative process is going through its own transitions. When I first began this journey as a living food chef, first of all, I had, I loved making food. So I was always the one watching Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart was my girl in college because, or my woman in college because that was the only channel that we got for free. So we used to, I used to watch Martha Stewart night and day. And um, it inspired me just to work in the kitchen. But as you know, and when I became a living foodist, it inspired me to make the foods that I wanted to eat. That's what inspired me first. And you know, I wanted a hot link. I mean, I was still detoxing. Now, I mean, a hot link is like, oh, but back then I'm like, man, can I just get a hot link? But I wasn't going to eat the hot link because I knew all the detriments that it, that it had. So what did I do is I said, well, I'm going to create something that tastes like a hot link. And when I created it, it tastes like a hot link and people were like, oh, this is delicious. I was like, wow. So it was the feedback of the, of the people I was feeding that, that definitely propels me. I love to see the light come on in people when they feel that healthy or raw vegan is like tasteless and it you know it doesn't taste good or it just tastes like a handful of nuts and seeds and you know dry and but when they taste it and they get that same fulfillment it's very fulfilling for me uh, and that was the same fulfillment that I got because I wanted enchiladas so I created raw vegan enchiladas I wanted pizza so I created raw vegan pizza that actually tasted like pizza you know um, so that was what propelled my creative process and it's interesting now because I'm not as much personally in my personal life tied to eating so much foods and also dense foods you know so now what really inspires me one is still the same reaction from the people I'm preparing food for that they feel that they can enjoy that and that is a transitional stage for them it could mean life or death for them, you know? And then on a personal journey, I love to see colors. So I'm a type of person that love to go to the farmer's market. And when I go, I just have these bursts of ideas of what I could create and um, 
colors and um, and fresh food. That that's really what inspires me. But I think it's just the energy of life and the energy of having the ability to tap into uh, tap into people's system. Because when you're feeding someone, it's beyond it's beyond just you're doing this this job. Like this food is is becoming part of them. It's becoming part of their cellular structure. Your thoughts that you put into it, my hands when I create, it goes into the food and my thoughts and my, my whole vibration goes into what I create and someone is consuming it into their structure. So um, it's inspiring to see the alchemy occurring within them, you know, like maybe they come in and they don't feel so good and then after they eat they feel great and they're happy and they're laughing. They may not even know they're laughing because I was laughing when I made the food. <laughs>